So welcome to um, Woman at the Wheel, my YouTube channel. I'm Sue. Hop in the truck and take a ride with me. You know, tell you a little bit about what's going on today. Um, it's Friday, May 6th, 2022. And it's about 5 in the afternoon. I'm heading west on uh, US 80 in Alabama at the moment. I'm on my way up to intersect with Interstate 20 and get over to Meridian, um, Mississippi, which is, looks like it's about 75 miles up the road if that sign is correct. So we got a ways to go yet. Um, Meridian's not too far into Mississippi. So we probably got, I don't know, 55, 60 miles of Alabama left to get through. And today I'm running back roads, but so I stopped last night at a motel in some little town south of McCalla. And uh, this morning I got up and got on 75 and just headed north into Georgia, and then I cut across Georgia into Alabama, and that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm basically trying to get home as quick as I can without running the interstate, which may add an hour to my trip overall, but the aggravation that I don't have, like dealing with interstate traffic and the big trucks and all that, it's well worth that extra hour to me. And I would probably lose that hour somewhere sitting in traffic anyway, or creeping through um, construction zones, or sitting in a standstill on the interstate when somebody, you know, has a fender bender and blocks the lane or whatever. So I don't mind the extra hour. So that's that's kind of where I am in the world. So there's the geography of it. And besides it gives you some better scenery than the interstate, because all you can see on the interstate is trees on both sides of the road. Here at least you can see some farmland and some little towns that we're gonna go through. So anyway, I just kind of want to talk about the trailer hauling business, since that's what I do. And if you're watching these videos, I, I, can, I guess I can think either you're watching them because you like watching road videos and you don't mind listening to me yak about it, or you have some interest in hauling something and that something might, that might interest you might be trailers. So. Um, here's basically Sue's primer to getting into the trailer hauling industry if this is what you're interested in. I would say to begin with as a minimum you need um, as a minimum and this is not where I would start I would start a level higher but as a minimum you need a regular uh, driver's license and uh, a good driving rec record and a three-quarter ton pickup. I don't recommend that. I would recommend that you take it up a notch and get yourself a CDL and a 110 truck and you still have to have a good driving record, good driving history. You can't be, um, you can't have a bunch of DUIs or anything because the regulations for truckers that apply to big trucks apply to little trucks also. So it doesn't matter what kind of truck you're driving as a CDL driver. Um, you have to have a good history to, to be able to do this. The other things you, that are required is that you can pass a, a CDL physical exam and there are several things you got to be able to pass on that like your blood pressure. Um, I think it's like they look for sleep apnea deals like the uh, circumference of your neck and your weight, things like that. Can you bend? Can you reach? Are you are you crippled up in any way? Basically, so there's there's some criteria for that, and then they do drug screening. You have to be able to pass that. And uh, once you've cleared all those hurdles, um, then you're you're pretty much ready to go look for a job. Now there are two ways you can go about this. You can either lease on your equipment to an existing motor carrier or you can become a motor carrier yourself and partner up um, have a contract with a brokerage and that's 
what I do. I am a motor carrier myself. I have my own DOT number on the door of my truck. And um, I have a contract. I'm contracted out to Star 32 out of Medill, Oklahoma, Star 32 Logistics. And they find all my work for me. And then they pay me and they handle everything except the driving. I do the driving, they do all the other stuff. So if you're not a motor carrier and you lease on with a company like that, then expect to pay, um, you pay so much per load, percentage wise usually, it's somewhere between, if you're um, leasing your equipment to them, it's probably going to be between 20 and 30 percent off the top of the load rate. And then you will get, like now when the fuel's real high, they'll also throw a fuel surcharge onto some of these loads. And then you get all of that. They don't take a percentage on that. Now I'm talking about the particular company I'm with. Some companies may just, um, you just need to talk to them and figure out if they've got a deal you can live with. Um, I've worked for uh, one other company right when I got out of truck driving school and they ripped me off so bad they taught me a lot I got some really valuable lessons out of it and they about robbed me blind I mean they stole all kinds of stuff from me money diesel <laughs> I, mean, I had no clue what I was getting into it was a den of thieves so um, you want to be careful and do your homework the best way to get a good company to get into a good company is to talk to other people who are in the business when their, uh, their company that they like working for is looking for help. Now, the company that I am working with, Star 32, and uh, Hitch and Ride, which is the small truck division of Star 32, they are always looking for drivers. Um, people come and go in this industry. People start up and try it for a while and decide they don't like it. Um, they might not they might not like being away from home so much lots of reasons people you know there's a lot of attrition and, and uh, turnover in the trucking anyway so with this people get in it thinking they're going to make a bucket of money but they've got so many bills that they end up not having enough money to, to cover their bills or whatever because you have to make money in this industry, you have to be really good at time management and money management. And you have to pretty much be debt free or close to it. So, things to think about. Um, if you're thinking about getting into the business and you don't have a vehicle, uh, I would suggest that you look around and find a reasonable used vehicle. Right now, vehicle prices are at an all time high for used and new because parts are getting harder to find, all the shortages and all this bullshit going on. But if you can find a reasonably um, good used vehicle that's not too old, not too beat up, then you can use that in this industry. That's what I'm driving. I'm driving a truck that when I bought it, it was four years old. It's 2018. And, uh, it had 100,000 miles on it, and it's working out good. I've had one one semi-major repair done, and that was this past weekend. Um, I did have to replace the def module that went out on it, and that was about a $1,500 buck deal with the uh, with the other stuff. It, the whole thing cost me about three grand with the job I lost, the part I replaced, and the motels while I was sitting in a strange town having the work done. But you know, that's part of the business. So you have to be ready for stuff like that. Um, but I, I would definitely advise um, anybody new coming in to at least think about getting your CDL and running a one ton. And the reason is a one ton truck with dualies on the back is more stable and distributes weight better and holds up longer than a three quarter ton pickup with single wheels on the back. It's just going to last longer. It's more versatile and you, you can take a little bit bigger loads. You don't have to take giant loads. Um, this truck, according to the manufacturer's specs, um, between the, this truck, me, my gear, 
any trailer I drag behind it plus whatever's on that trailer, I can haul, with the whole thing can weigh up to 39,600 pounds. Now I'm licensed for that weight, but I will not ever go to that weight in actual practice. Um, to get to that weight, my truck weighs about 10,400 pounds. So to get up to 39,600, do the math, and it'd be like 29,000 pounds, I won't put that much weight on this truck. My cutoff is 25,000 pounds. That's the maximum I'll put on this truck. That leaves me plenty of leeway, legally. So if I cross a scale, I've got you know several thousand pounds under my maximum weight and it keeps down the wear and tear on the truck on the components of the truck if I don't overload them now I'm not talking about overloading them dangerously I'm talking about overloading what I think should go on them to maximize the life of the truck so I want this truck to last for several more years and I'm running it pretty hard I mean I've been running it for about six months and I'm doing about 10,000 miles a month. So that's pretty consistent running. So the other thing is maintenance. I, I keep it maintained and I'm real finicky about it. Um, so that's how you make a truck last. So when you go to look at a truck, if you don't already own one, keep all of that in mind and apply accordingly to the job that you're going to use it for. So there are various types of trailers that I haul and my favorite is just the single trailer. It's also the lowest paying haul usually unless it's just a super big single trailer. Um, so I've, I've got a base rate for um, hauling one trailer at a time and I, I forgive it's like a dollar it just went up so I think it might be a dollar ninety ninety two a mile um, that base rate I won't get charged any I won't get paid any less for hauling a single trailer but in some cases I'll get paid more because my broker guy that I work with knows that it costs more to haul a bigger trailer so the bigger trailers he'll he'll quote a higher price on he'll push that price as high as he reasonably can push it because he knows, you know, it costs a lot of money to move this stuff. We pay the freight on moving everything and then we get reimbursed. That's how the business works. So if you've got a good broker or a good company to work with, he'll work with you on that. He'll try and get you the best rate possible while still keeping it reasonable enough that he can keep getting business. So that's kind of a, the fine line they walk. So. That's the first um, level of pay. The second level of pay is when I haul doubles, tie together doubles. And what that is is like two horse trailers or two cargo trailers or two stock trailers or a cargo trailer and a horse trailer. And the front one is attached to the, my truck and the second one is attached to the back of the first trailer. So pulling doubles is something that takes a little bit of practice and you can't be afraid to do it. It's not really all that scary. I kind of tend to worry about it until I'm actually doing it and then it's fine. Um, do you, you just have to watch your turns and you, you got to watch where you park because you can't really back up. You can't make that back trailer behave itself. You can only control the front trailer. The back trailer does its own thing, which could be anything. So you don't want to be backing up, but it's not that bad. But that's the second level of pay. It pays like, I don't know, five or 10 cents more a mile than um, the single trailer pays. The best pay of all in, in this particular company is for stacks. Now, stacks are like, you'll take, uh, um, oh, let's just use the, exa the example of the one I just hauled. It was a 35 foot flatbed dovetail trailer and um, gooseneck and they put a smaller tilt trailer, 14 foot tilt trailer up on top of it. And I hauled the two of them together down to Florida. Well, they pay more for stacks because you have to do more work when you pick up a stack because you actually have to strap that stack together. And sometimes these stacks can be two trailers. Sometimes they're three trailers. 
I've seen stacks as high as five or six trailers, depending on what kind of trailers they are, what size. So some of these stacks can be pretty tall, but you have to strap them together. So it's a lot of work. And they're kind of, I don't know, they freak me out a little bit because sometimes they get so tall and they seem top heavy. I don't know that they really are, but that's how they look. But I've never had any problem with anything tipping or anything. It's just, just the idea that it might because, you know, stacking stuff up. So but they kind of freak me out a little bit. I don't really like hauling them, and I may quit hauling them here because I'm getting old enough. I don't really want to fall off of them trying to hook them up either or strap them. But that's also another topic. But So that's the third tier of pay, and that's the highest paying jobs that we get. Now, you have to be able to pretty much do any one of those or all three of those to make good money and you have to be able to not turn down a lot of jobs. So I'm, I'm, I try not to turn down much of anything even though some of them I should have turned down. Like I should have turned down this job. I didn't make very much on this because the distance and the time involved. This stuff you learn as you go along. I didn't think about it. It seemed like good pay at the time, but then here I am. It's going to take me two, two full days to get home and another night in a motel. So, and all this fuel. And fuel went up last week. So, you know, my fuel surcharge was relatively small compared to what I've had to put out for fuel on, on this round trip. So... But I try not to turn a bunch of stuff down because I try and be agreeable so they'll give me more work. I mean, it's kind of a catch-22. But I'm going to start getting a little bit more finicky about it. And uh, I'll post another video on that next week after I get my formula figured out. So what I'm going to try and figure out is my optimum range where I'm making money. And then when I go beyond that range, when I start losing money. So, but I'll work on that this weekend and get a video out on that next week, hopefully. Um, so, as far as how the industry works, once you've got your, um, your CDL, your truck, your insurance, your driver's history, all of that, if you want to lease on to a company, an existing motor carrier, um, like the company I work for does that too, um, what would happen is you go to work for them, and it's either... Um, 70 or 80 percent is what you get of the load. I'm not sure what it is. You'd have to find out. But generally somewhere between 70 and 80 percent. So they take 20 to 30 percent off the top if you're running on their operating authority. Plus you pay them so much every week to be covered on their insurance. And so that you don't have to mess with any of your um, paperwork or any of that they do all the paperwork so they would be filing any if to reporting they'll give you if to stickers for your truck um, they'll give you um, electronic logging devices th things like that they'll they'll provide all this stuff for you if you're leased on to them if you're leasing your equipment on to them and there's there's two ways you can do that too you can lease your equipment and then drive yourself or you can lease your equipment and hire your own driver so it depends on what you want to do but they have to be agreeable with the driver you put in there if you're leased to them um, the only time you would probably do that is if you've got multiple trucks that you want to put out there but you don't want to mess with your own um, getting your own authority and becoming a motor carrier yourself and then you hire people to put in the trucks you're not going to make a lot of money that way these days because people want to be paid a lot and um, there's not that much meat on the bone to where it would support two people on one truck so uh, but it is a, a possibility if you've got multiple trucks out there just something to think about but for the average owner operator who's just looking to run their own truck, then it's a pretty good setup. So they will keep you busy, they'll assign you work, and then you'll go do the work. And you, you always have the right to turn down a job as an owner operator, even if you're leased on. If it's something you're not comfortable with, you think it's unsafe or it's uh, dangerous in some way, then absolutely you can turn it down. Or if, if it's not convenient for you, if like 
uh, they want you to go to Maine and you don't, just don't have time or don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. But you can, I just don't like to get in the habit of saying no too much because I don't want them to call somebody else when they got work. I want them to call me. So it's entirely up to you what work you accept or reject. So it's pretty much the same if you've got your um, own operating authority, except you only pay them 10% off the top of your rate. Of course, you get all of the fuel surcharge, and then they take care of everything for you except for the IFTA reporting, which I do all that myself because I have my own carrier number. I got my own IFTA stickers and all of that. So it just depends on how much you want to do as far as paperwork um, and all that on top of the driving. So those are the two ways that it can work. Now, the rates, right now the rates are running anywhere from about $1.90-ish, um, up over $2 a mile, plus fuel surcharges. Um, on this trip, I think my mileage was like 1,200 miles. My fuel surcharge was $300 on this run. So there's a formula for that too. You can look it up on the internet and see how that works. I don't care too much because the the people I work for are like really honest and upfront with me. So I don't have any issues with them. I don't have to do any double checking or any of that. I can pretty much trust them to to do what they're supposed to do. They always have. Um, they're trustworthy people. Unlike the first people I ever worked with in trucking who were not trustworthy people. So a lot of it just depends on the people you're working for or working with. So what happens when you actually get a job to go pick up a trailer? It depends. <laughs> it depends on where you're going. It depends on um, the if you're going to a plant or if you're going to a dealership or wherever. Every place that you go is going to have a different process for getting these trailers ready. And sometimes it takes a little bit of a learning curve. For the most part, the factories have a set process that they go through, especially like big techs. They've got their own system and each factory has their own twist on that system. So until you're there and you actually go through it once or twice and see how it works, you're going to feel kind of lost. But the people there are really nice in the shipping departments, and they'll walk you through it. They'll, you know, they're they're used to seeing new faces, and they know how to get you pointed in the right direction. Um, a typical pickup at a dealership is going to be um, they'll show you the trailer that you're supposed to take, and then it's up to you to do all of the prep work to get that trailer ready to go. Which means hooking it up, checking your lights, checking your brakes, checking your lug nuts. Um, doing all this stuff, um, making sure that it's it's um, going to be legal and safe to haul, um, making sure that you got everything connected correctly, and making sure you have the right paperwork. So you need something in your possession. It's called a bill of lading, and some guys don't worry about this. I do because I obsess over every detail. So I have my own bills of lading because I'm my own motor carrier. On my bill of lading, I can describe the thing I'm hauling. So um, I might put bison, um, horse, living combo, new, and then um, this last four of the serial number or whatever, whatever the number is on it I've got. Because a lot of them will go by the last part of the serial number or the last part of the VIN as the trailer number or the load number. And then I'll put all my notes on the, the bill of lading, like um, the things I check, the lights, the brakes, the lugs, and then I'll put my beginning mileage and a place for the ending mileage and the total mileage. So at the end of the trip, I'll have this all on one sheet. And then I have somebody there sign this, unless it's an after hours pickup or they have their own bill of lading that they give me and have me sign, because that is also permission to, to move that trailer. Now, a lot of these, um, dealers won't do that, but a lot of the manufacturers will. But you need some paper in your possession saying that you have the legal authority to haul this trailer, and that's going to be called a bill of lading. So if you don't have one from them, you need to make up one, I guess, or have your own form. 
um, just to cross your T's and dot your I's. The other thing you're going to have is probably a ticket. Like if you, if you were working for Star 32, they give me a stack of tickets. And what that is, it's a little two-part form. And I put that same information on this ticket, plus the rate, plus my fuel surcharge. And I add them up at the bottom, and that's the total that the customer pays for this load. And I sign the ticket. I put my name on it. And I write in the details, like where I'm picking up from and where I'm delivering to and the date. So it has all that on it. So I've got these two pieces of information plus whatever paperwork I get from the dealership or uh, the manufacturer or the individual in some cases. And it might be a title. It might be um, a packet with all the information with booklets and extra lug nuts. I mean, it could be anything. So you get all this information and all these things together when you get the trailer. Now, some places you will go for an after hours pickup and you'll do all the same stuff, but the paperwork will be on the trailer somewhere, usually up in the neck someplace. And they'll know you're coming, they'll have it waiting for you. So, you know, you just kind of do the same process, but there's nobody there to help you. So you have to be able to um, back under the trailer by yourself. You have to be able to set the trailer down on your gooseneck ball or on the hitch by yourself. Make sure that it's all correctly done so it's a secure connection. You have to be able to make sure you've got all your um, safety chains, your breakaway, brake, cable, um, your lights. Everything has to be done. So you got you still got to do all the same stuff. But you just have to do it by yourself. Sometimes you have to do it in the dark. Um, so you have to think about all this stuff in advance. So you need certain tools with you and stuff. You'll you'll figure that out. But for the most part, that's what you do when you go pick it up. Either you're going to go to a factory and they're going to check all the lugs right there in front of you, or you're going to be out there with your torque wrench checking the lugs yourself. If you don't see somebody do it, you better do it. Because I'll tell you, it's no fun having a wheel come off. So I, I do all this stuff. I'll go through the whole process. And then when I'm ready to go, the last thing I do on the way out of the gate is I recheck my brakes because I had brakes fail on a trailer and I got a ticket over it and I don't want to do that again. So I check the brakes when I hook it up and start it up the first time. I also check it on the way out the gate to make sure that nothing's changed. And I'll do that periodically through the whole trip. Sometimes when I slow down at a red light or whatever, I'll just check those trailer brakes again just to make sure that they're still working. This is what they'll do. Sometimes I found out on these Dodges is the cumulative use of the fuse in there at some point that fuse may just have enough and then you need to change out your fuse in your fuse box that controls your trailer lights so you want to be checking those you don't want to, you don't want to get the surprise i got and have a trailer not work after it did work and then have it do it at the worst possible time which is in a full dot inspection and then get get a trailer put out of service and get a ticket for it which is what happened to me I don't want to see that happen to you. So these are things you learn as you go along. Once you've got the trailer, once you've picked it up, the main objective is to get it safely to where it's going on time. So um, you can pretty much figure how long it's going to take you to get there if you look at your GPS or Google Maps or whatever. And I always give myself an extra couple of hours because it's not just drive time, it's also stopping and getting fuel. Every eight hours you have to stop and take a 30 minute break. So that there's extra time added onto it. You're gonna be stopping and peeing, you're gonna be stopping and doing this and that. So you have to add on some time for incidentals. So if somebody wants an ETA from me, I give them the Google time plus a couple hours. And I'm, if it's a long trip, I may give them the Google time plus four or five hours. If it's like a 2,000 mile trip, I'd give myself extra padding in there because you never know what's gonna happen. You might sit in traffic for three hours in one spot and it puts you behind. You know, if, if you build in some wiggle room, you'll be a lot happier with that. So anyway, once you got the trailer, you take it and you deliver it. And if you can't deliver it when you get there with it, let's say you get there after hours, if you're going like to a dealership or or something and they close at five and you don't get there till six well then you're going to go sit under that load all night until they open the next day and then you're going to go deliver it unless there's been some arrangement made
before and after hours delivery. Um, what I found is that if I'm going to be there close to the time they close, like within a few minutes, most of the time they'll sit there and wait on me. And I'll really bust my butt to get it there so they're not sitting and waiting very long. If it's going to be more than an hour after they close, I just plan on delivering it the next day. And I'll go find a motel or whatever, um, whatever your preference is. But you get it delivered, um, you get them to sign off on it. On our tickets, we write no damage. If we didn't damage anything, we write no damage. Make an X and draw a line, and they sign that, and we give them a copy, and we keep a copy, and that copy we have goes back to the office, so we get paid for it. I take a picture of that, that page and text it directly to the lady who does our bookkeeping, so she has it the minute I deliver. And then later, I'll next time I'm going through there, or I will put them all in an envelope, but I'll get them all the originals back eventually, but it might be a week or two before I get them there. So that's pretty much the, the start to finish on a load. Now that time that you take to get the load there could be an hour or it could be a week. It depends on how far away it is. But I pretty much follow the same method every time. It's always the same process. And I'll, I'll tell you, I will check lugs now, um, even on a short run, because you don't have to run very far with loose lug nuts for one of those wheels to come off and then you're you're talking big trouble so don't skip any of these steps if you you know if you want to do this safely and without with the least amount of problems you don't skip any of the steps you just get in the habit of doing it the same way every time no matter what and then you won't forget to do it when it's time to do it the other thing that you're going to do when you pick up the trailer and i i don't know why i kind of skimmed over it while you're checking everything, you do a pre-trip inspection on that trailer, too. So, like, when I pick up, I'm always doing my pre-trip inspection. I'm looking under the trailer for hanging wires, especially, um, because on some of these new trailers, once in a while, they'll forget to tuck them up under there and, and attach them. So, you need to look at stuff like that, checking all the lights, you want to make sure all the lights work. Um, just... You know, you just go around and do this stuff, and then before you leave, you make sure that any of your your handle cranks, your crank handles, all this stuff is properly stowed. You don't want anything flopping around out on the road because you're going to damage the trailer. Um, make sure your landing gear's all the way up, all that kind of stuff. So you just kind of do walk around, and then you, you, you're free to go on out with it. But So that's typically what's involved in it. Um, the other part about what's involved in it is just dealing with traffic on the road and driving. So, I mean, if you're already doing that, then you, you've got that under control. So, the other unknown is like when you're delivering to an individual. And a lot of times when you get a trailer that's going to an individual party, they will want you to call them when you take off with the trailer and give them an ETA and then they will bug you the whole time that you're traveling. They'll call you multiple times. And so just be nice. They're just antsy and they're anxious to get their trailer. Sometimes they paid a lot of money for that trailer or, you know, any money to a lot of people is a lot of money. So they're just antsy and I just be nice to them and reassuring, you know, I'm like everything's going fine. I'm on schedule. You know, my, this is my ETA. If you have any questions, call me back. Calling me is fine. If you get antsy about it, call me. And that, that kind of eases your, your, your uh, pathway with the with the buyer um, when they're an individual. It's it would be easy to get kind of aggravated with my guests when they've called you about the sixteenth time or whatever. But you know, it's <laughs> you just kind of learn to roll with it because they're not trying to give you hell. They're just you know, most of them are just excited. They're like a kid at Christmas time. They got this new thing coming and they want to see it. So. I kind of try and you know take it in that vein. Um, try and think if there's anything else unusual. Oh, motels, yeah, night stopping while you're hauling trailers at night. You've got to be real aware of the length of your trailer and where you're going to stop for the night and where you're going to park for the night. So I use Google Maps a lot 
um, to look at parking lots and motels and stuff. Now, I'll go off on a little tangent here about where to stay. Some guys sleep in their trucks and it's not entirely kosher, but I'm not sure what they've decided about the rules. I know they've been debating this since I was, since I started back in 2010. And I don't know if they've ever come to any firm conclusion about that. I stay in motels. If this job doesn't pay me enough to sleep indoors in a bed, um, like a human being and, and all of that, they're not paying me enough. So I personally stay in motels. Now I will, on occasion, stay in the trailers that I haul, but only the used trailers. I don't stay in the new ones because somebody's paying for a new trailer, it should be new, right? Now I don't wanna, if I'm buying a new trailer, I don't want somebody else sleeping on the bed in it before I get there. So even on the used ones, I don't sleep in the bed, on the like the master bed. And for practical reasons, it's harder than hell for me to get up in there because most of these are the beds are sitting on a platform up above the gooseneck connection. So you got to be like a kid to crawl up in there anyway, <laughs> or small. You have to be short or or you know, I'm too damn tall and too damn old to be crawling up in anything. So what I'll usually do is I have couple of deals I got a quilt and a comforter and nice pillow I keep them under the back seat of my truck to keep them clean so in the used trailers if I'm not feeling like staying in a motel or I want to save a little money and like if I'm not finding a motel if I'm in an area where the motels are really expensive or something I'll just stay in the trailer at a truck stop but I won't park on the truck stop side I'll park on the passenger side because a lot of these truck stops now have RV parking and I'll go around on that side because I'm not going to pull in and sit beside the truckers sitting there all night running their motors and they will and even in the other side you're going to get in there with truckers that run their generators they're not quite as loud but still it's annoying but that's a viable option for me as opposed to spending 80 or 100 bucks for a motel or 180 bucks for a motel in some cases so if I can save some money that way and increase my profit, I will. Um, the other thing that I will do, even sometimes with the new ones, if, if I'm real concerned about it and can't find a place, or if I'm someplace where the motels are just too far and few between, and there's a lot of RV parks that are kind of wide open, I'll pull into an RV park and stop with, a, with them. And I'll do this sometimes even with the new ones because there are places that I'm afraid if you pull in with a nice trailer like that in a motel parking lot, you might be at risk of somebody either hitting it, damaging it, or, you know, who knows, trying to jack your truck and the trailer too. And sometimes in these motels, you can't necessarily see where you're parked. You can't see the parking lot where your truck's at. That drives me crazy. I like to be able to see it. So in certain circumstances, I've been known to do that. I've been, I've been known to park in an RV park. A word of caution on that. Some of these horse um, living quarters combos are too damn big to be taken into any RV parks um, that look like they might have small or tight access. Some of these things are huge. And if you get in there with one of these great big ones, you might not get back out again. I mean, it's that, that some of those um, RV parks are that tight. So I wouldn't take a great big one in there. I would rather um, park in a wide open motel parking lot with the giant ones like that than to, than to risk taking them in and not being able to get them either in the, the pull throughs or um, get them back out of the park. You don't usually have this problem out west with RV parks, because they're usually more wide open. They give you more elbow space and more, they're laid out better. The ones in the east and, and the ones I've seen like near cities and stuff, some of those are so tight that I wouldn't want to take like my 20 foot Shasta in there, let alone some 40 foot horse combo. So you gotta kind of be careful with that too. 
but there's an advantage to that, especially if you're if you've got a used one that you're actually going to stay in. Um, you can pull in there, and and then you, if you're in an RV park, you have showers and restrooms available. So that's kind of a, a plus for that, and they're a lot less than a motel. So that's another thing I might do. Um, you just have to find your own way with that because, I mean, sometimes I think I, I hate paying for motels, but at the same time, it, it is a cost of doing business. It's deductible. I hate paying it up front, but, you know, it's, it's just, I don't know. It's kind of one of those gray areas you just kind of got to figure it out. But that's that's what I do anyway. Uh, it's a kind, of a kind of a combination of all of the above. But pr primarily, I do stay in motels. So, if I were a man, I will say, I might think a lot differently about it, but I'm not. I'm a woman, and I'm, it just creeps me out, the idea of sleeping in my truck, um, you know, and having people walk by and being able to look in the truck while I'm sleeping. I, that, I don't dig that. Uh -uh. <laughs> Maybe it's a girl thing. It could be. So anyway, that's pretty much, in a nutshell, um, everything you need to know about the trailer hauling industry to see if it's something that might interest you. Now, I'm sure if you've gotten all the way through this, you probably got some questions. If you do, post them below and I'll answer them. Um, that's that's kind of everything I can think of off the top of my head on the topic. So I hope that's helpful to you. Um, I hope you enjoyed the scenery. Um, we're almost to the Mississippi line. We're like 16 miles, 17 miles from Mississippi. Um, I probably won't let this run that long. I think I'm going to shut it off here and give my voice a break. I've been having a little bit of allergies today. So everything's blooming down here, so everything's giving me you know, scratchy eyes and tickly throats. But anyway, um, I guess I'm going to go ahead and sign off. And I just want to say thanks for riding along with me today. Um, thanks for listening. If you made it clear through this, congratulations. I don't know um, if it was real interesting or not. But it should be information that could be helpful to you if you're considering this as something that you might be interested in doing. So um, I guess I'll sign off and I'll see you next time. Thanks for riding.